This morning we come to a passage that is unlike anything that we've encountered in our study of the book of Acts. So far, every passage that we've studied through the book of Acts has resulted in increase and growth of the church in a very positive way. And while there's been times of persecution in every passage so far, you've noticed that God has been faithful in delivering men and women from such persecution. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37 onwards, the preaching of Peter results in people turning from their sin and to belief in Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, verse 23 and onwards, the preaching of Peter and John, while initially met with opposition, eventually resulted in their release from captivity. Chapter 5, verse 12 and onwards, Peter and the rest of the apostles, again, though initially met with opposition, are eventually freed as well. All throughout the book of Acts, at least up until this point, whenever there has been opposition, there has been some way of release or redemption or vindication from that opposition. But this morning's text is not the same case. It seems as if every time the apostles narrowly escape with their lives, and if we were to stop there, we might be tempted to think to ourselves that no matter what happens, even if we get persecuted, God would find a way to deliver us from that persecution as long as we are faithful. But this morning, as we come before Acts chapter 7, through chapter 8, verse 3, this pattern ends. This morning, we're going to come before a section of Scripture where we come before our first actual death of a faithful servant of God, Stephen, and its implications for our lives. Now, I understand who who Stephen is. We go back to Acts chapter 6 and remind that Stephen was one of the seven who were chosen. And this man, particularly, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to find that though he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and though he was faithful to God, he loses his life for the sake of the gospel. We're going to find that even in death, the gospel flourishes. The church father, Tertullian, he once put it this way. Maybe you've heard this quote before. But the church father, Tertullian, he said this once about martyrs. He said this, The blood of martyrs, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And what Tertullian was trying to say in that statement was very simple. That it's from the death of martyrs that the church grows. Or to spin it in another way, as my title would say it, divine flourishing in in violent oppression. The blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. And so let's jump right into our text this morning. What is the point of Acts chapter 7, (coughs) verses 54 through 83? Luke, he records the first martyr, Stephen, and the subsequent persecution, and ultimately the spread of the gospel. The passage divides up really into two basic movements. The first is found in chapter 7, 7 verses 54 to the end of the chapter, and it's this, the death of Stephen. As we come into this section of scripture in Acts chapter 7, verse 54, we are met with the aftermath, uh, the aftermath of Stephen's faithful preaching. Stephen has not shied away from the faithful preaching of the gospel. He has boldly proclaimed who Christ is before the Jews. And the response, notice, it's not applause. Nor is it heartfelt desire to repent as they respond to Peter back in Acts chapter 2 verse 37, being cut to the heart and responding with repentance. But rather, notice what happens here in verse 54 of chapter 7. After Stephen preaches, this is what we read here. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. And I want you to notice that. Notice the violent language the Bible uses here. This is not mere annoyance. This is not mere disagreement. Our English translations depict the reaction of these men like rabid animals, those who are out for blood. They were on the verge of literally tearing Stephen apart. And there's good reason why our Bibles use such language like this. Because in the original Greek, is literally that these people were infuriated to their hearts. And it describes a visceral, emotional reaction of anger that burns in their souls. This is not just mere annoyance. This is anger to the point where you could see their fists tremble and shake. That you can see their faces turn red. That you knew something bad was about to happen. It erupts from their hearts and souls. Like the people back in chapter 2, verse 37, who were cut to the heart. So these two these people were also cut to the heart. Except they were cut to the heart, not to repent, but with a completely different reaction. An uncontrollable fury that was about to be unleashed. 
So put yourself in Stephen's sandals during this time. How would you respond? As you sat there preaching before hundreds of Jews, and you see their anger seethe from their souls, what would you be thinking? Perhaps you would be scared. Perhaps you'd be frightened. Perhaps you would want to leave and run away as we speak. But I want you to notice that Stephen's attention is not on the people, but it is on Jesus Christ. And that's significant. We read in verses 55 through 56 that despite their anger, despite their seething rage, we read this, but he, referring to Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And don't miss that. I want you to think about why this is so important to us. Out of all the ways that Stephen could describe Jesus Christ here, he doesn't describe him as his Savior, though this is true. He doesn't describe him as the Lamb who was slain, though this is also true. But rather, he is seen as the Son of Man who stands at the right hand of God. And this is significant. It's significant because this imagery stretches all the way back to the Old Testament. The Son of Man in the Old Testament was featured most prominently in Daniel chapter 7 verse 13, in which Daniel, he has a vision of the future. And in this vision, he sees a coming person, something like the Son of Man, something in the figure of the Son of Man, who receives all power and control of the universe. And this is what Daniel records for us in Daniel chapter 7 verse 14. And to him, notice this, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. For this purpose, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Dominion is everlasting, is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and that his kingdom won, and that shall not be destroyed. Similarly, the right hand of God is featured most prominently in Psalm chapter 110, verse 1, in which David, this is what he says about the one who sits at the right hand of the throne of God. He says this, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, and notice this, until I make your enemies your footstool. And as the rest of the Psalm 110 continues, it continues to describe who this person is, that he is a person who has rulership, who has power, control, and absolute, absolute domination and dominion over everything. In other words, when you take these two, pa- these two, take these two images together, Son of God, <coughs> who sits at the right hand, who is the Son of Man, who has dominion and authority, the picture that you see of Jesus here is a king with complete power and authority. What is being pictured here is the glory of Jesus Christ as the absolute king who is domination over the entire universe. And this makes all the difference. This makes all the difference because it means for Stephen (coughs) that what is more important It's not the opinion of mere mortals, but the approval of the king of the universe who promises to return to reign and will have complete dominion over all, including his enemies, those who reject him like these Jews. This is why the text tells us that according to most scholars, Jesus stands as a visible reminder of his approval of Stephen and his words. And think about that. This is what captures Stephen's attention. It's not the seething anger. It's not the people uh, growling in rage. What captures his attention is not the hundreds of Jews who want his blood, but what captures his attention is the glory of Christ. And what a lesson that is for us. When we are faithful to sharing the gospel, we are faithful to Christ. And understand that there will only be two responses. The first we saw back in chapter 2, verse 37, that the people will be cut to the heart and will respond with repentance and with broken heartness. And they will ask, what can we do to be saved? But it is often the case that people respond not with acceptance, but with violent rejection, as these people do. And it can be scary to face such realities. But I want you to think about this. Who cares about the opinion of sheep? when you have the approval of a lion. When we see Jesus as Lord and as King, whose approval means everything, and is far greater than the opinions of mere men, then it strengthens us to remain faithful just as Stephen was, even in spite of violent opposition, even in spite of death. And it only does so because Stephen had a vision of Jesus Christ that eclipsed what he saw of the crowd. 
And that's the same way with us all the time, isn't it? Do you ever notice, and I've used this example more, more, more times at one than once, that guys will do anything they can to get the approval of the girl that they like. That they will do everything they can. They will do everything they can, even if it shames them before their friends. I remember back when I was in elementary school, there was this one girl I liked. She was a lot taller than me, and she was white. But she was a lot taller than me, and I really liked her. I thought she was awesome, and I think just because I, I grew up in South Africa, I wasn't very used to a lot of Chinese people, and then growing up in Santa Ana, I wasn't very used to a lot of Chinese people either. So obviously, my, my first crush was a white girl, and she was, she, she was tall. I mean, she's really tall. Like, <laughs> she, she talks she like at least good head over me. Anyways, I remember the first time I, I started noticing her, the first time I started liking her, I started talking to her a little more. We began talking to her a little more, and all my friends would make fun of me. Uh, uh, Matt and Jane are singing in the tree. Okay, I says, I all that stuff, right? They'll make fun of me and do all these things. And every day, right, despite what they thought, I would do everything I can to make this girl happy. I would buy her, I don't know, a happy meal or whatever I did <coughs> back as I did in elementary school or, or a teddy bear. That's right. That's right. I had game back in elementary school, right? That's the way I rode, right? But I would do everything I can to win her approval, even if my friends made fun of me. Why? Because what mattered to me more at that point was her approval and not theirs. So it is with Christ. When you have this vision of Christ as Stephen does, and you understand him as Lord and King, as God is greater than anything that life has to offer, who cares about what the people think? You will stand for Christ, even in spite of death, even in spite of violent opposition. In fact, notice what happens next. <coughs> As Stephen continues to speak, the anger of the crowd eventually explodes. And it explodes into a bloodthirsty, mob-like frenzy. And thus, in verse 57, we read these words here. But they cried out with a loud voice, and they stopped their ears, and they rushed together at him. And for what purpose? Notice in verse 58, it continues. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. In other words... These people respond in anger immediately by putting Stephen to death. Understanding here that within this text, there's no formal process here. There's no trial, nothing. There is no sense of a verdict being held. There's no, there's no uh, order whatsoever. Historically, this was a mob. This is a mob that would have taken Stephen, thrust him into a ditch, and immediately find the largest boulders or stones that they could find, not just little pebbles, and hurl it at his head in order to kill him. They weren't throwing marbles at him. They weren't throwing little pebbles. They were throwing rocks, huge stones at his head. Yet even in this, notice how Stephen responds here. His thoughts remain on Jesus. We read in verses 59 through 60. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep, meaning he died. And what an amazing testimony this is. Peter's thoughts were completely on Jesus Christ. He looked to Jesus to not only save him, but he looked to Jesus to also forgive and save the crowd. And isn't that something that we can learn from? See, notice that Stephen's thoughts are so with Christ, are so centered on Jesus that even his thoughts become Christ's own. See, oftentimes when we fall victim to people, we often think about ourselves. We turn to thinking about ourselves, our, our families, our friends, but certainly not to our enemies, certainly not to those who would hurt us. And if we do so, it's usually in order to curse them. It's usually in order to invoke some type of curse upon them, maybe cuss them out if you're ungodly, whatever it is. So what is it about Stephen that allowed him to respond as he did? It wasn't because he was special. It was because he had the right perspective. His thoughts were on Jesus. And his, as his thoughts lingered and thought about Jesus Christ, his thoughts became the same as Jesus Christ. Which is why he cries out, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. Lord, forgive them, in other words, for they know not what they do. And that makes all the difference. Now, I wish I could say that this, that this story ends here. That Stephen's prayer and actions changed the crowd, but unfortunately, it doesn't. In fact, notice this, it incited a particular person that we saw back in verse 58 to take it a step further. And his name was Saul. And what do we read here in verse 8, verse 1, chapter 8, verse 1? It says this, And Saul approved of his execution. 
And so we move to the second movement of this passage, the persecution by Saul. Read verse eight, chapter 8, verse 1 one more time. It says this, Saul approved of his execution. What occurs here at this point is a shift in the narrative. What had happened was that with Stephen was that it was a foreshadow of things to come. For we continue in verse 1, that after Saul approved of his execution, there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in, Jer in Jerusalem, and they were scattered all throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. In other words, what occurs from Stephen's death is not a change. It's not like the movies in which the people, once they see Stephen die in this particular manner, all of a sudden they're inspired. All of a sudden they think about their wrongs and they have sympathy and they have a change of heart. There's no admiration here. But it becomes a catalyst, notice this, to a systematic statewide action of violence, of violent persecution against the church of, of Jerusalem. To the point that the people scattered. No one felt safe. And although according to verse 2, we read that devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, such an action is overshadowed, overshadowed by Saul in verse 3, in which it says here that Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And put yourselves in the sandals of these Jerusalem Christians. You just watched one of your most faithful members be stoned and executed by a violent mob because of his preaching of the gospel. As you go back to your homes, reeling from the blow, heavy with heart, mourning over the loss of a person that you've called your friend, you hear screams of terror echo throughout the streets. Heavy sadness is immediately cut off by the sound of a man named Saul dragging people into prison. And as a result, your number's thin. You begin to notice that the person that you saw last week at church is no longer there anymore. That the person that you saw in Bible study is no longer there anymore. And as the months and weeks continue, you begin to notice more and more people missing. And then you begin to hear rumors that this person was dragged off to prison by Saul. That this person, while he's sleeping in the middle of the night, saw violently gra grab this person and dragged him out to the streets, beat him, and threw him in prison. And you are thinking to yourself at this point, at any second, I would be next. As a Christian, you might be thinking to yourself, is this the end? Is that it for the gospel? Does it stop here? But there's something about this text that despite the darkness of what has happened, a light still pierces through. And although not necessarily a movement of the text, I do want to draw you to another point for the sermon, and it is this. The Gospels spread. Notice back in verse chapter 8, verse 1. <coughs> that there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And notice this. They were scattered all throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. When was the last time that you mentioned these two cities together? If you go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we were reminded of Jesus Christ promising his apostles with these words, that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And notice this, you will be by witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Notice that. Jesus made a promise to his disciples that they will be witnesses beyond Jerusalem. That they would spread out to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And though it would seem in chapter 8 verse 3 that, the, that there was a stifling of the spread of the gospel by Saul, it is in reality the spread of the gospel. The story of Acts doesn't end in chapter 8 verse 3. It doesn't end with, the, with Saul murdering Christians. In fact, Saul's life doesn't end. We know later on in chapter 9, he goes from Saul to Paul, the greatest missionary ever known. And though Saul had at one point at this life believed that he was stopping the gospel at this point, the truth cannot, could be, the reality could not be farther from the truth. That the gospel would spread. 
despite persecution, despite death, despite violent oppression. There will be divine flourishing in violent oppression. The book of Acts itself does not end. We go even past Acts chapter 28, verse 30 to 31. The gospel continues to be proclaimed. Why? Because Jesus promised and is sovereign that the gospel would go about beyond the regions of Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. It will go out to the ends of the earth, to which today we will be commissioning our missions teams to do just that. <coughs> In other words, God uses both the suffering of the church and the peace of the church in order to spread the gospel. And he does that to this day. What a wonderful truth that is for us. Because no matter what happens, understand that God will see to that not only is his message proclaimed, but that that message will be received and spread to those who would respond. The question for us is this, will we take part of it? You see, being a Christian is no easy task. While we do not experience the same type of suffering that these Christians did back in chapter 7 and chapter 8, we do understand that being Christian today is no easy task. Proclaiming the gospel is no easy task. As Christians, we are met with a danger of violent rejection and oppression, perhaps less so in the States, but there still is that fear today. Maybe for you today, there is a fear of rejection in the form of your friends and family members not accepting the gospel. That is the case for me. As a pastor now, long having shared the gospel with my family, with my parents at least, for at least three or four times, even till this day, I find myself afraid of sharing the gospel with them. Perhaps it is oppression in the form of people at your school proclaiming that you are a bigot because of your beliefs. I feel the same way. Though not in school, in the public places. Whenever I go to the gym to see my buddies who I work out with there, I'm always afraid to share the gospel with them because I know for the most part that they're all very liberal. And know for the most part that if they wanted to, they can kill me with that 45 plate, but that's beside the point. Whatever it is, let me tell you now that your fears are legitimate. We do not want to undermine those fears. We do not want to undermine the legitimacy of those fears. No one likes to undergo rejection. I hate rejection. So the big question is this. How do we remain faithful? When... The fear of rejection is so big. How do we remain faithful to Christ? And to answer that question, I want you to direct your thoughts to Stephen. What made Stephen faithful? It's not that he was special. It was the fact that he had a view of Jesus that eclipsed the view of others. In other words, when we have a view of Christ that is so large and so great, the opinion of the world pales in comparison. <coughs> It'll always come down to who or what you believe is greater in your hearts. And so what does this look like for us? For those of you who are fearful of sharing the gospel at your school because you're afraid of people rejecting you, let me ask you this. Ask yourself this. What matters more? Does the opinion of Jesus matter more or does the rejection of man matter more to you? For those of you who are faithful or who are fearful of standing up for Christ with your family members because you're afraid of what your cousin, your aunt, your uncle, your siblings, maybe your parents might even say, let me ask you this, what matters more to you? The opinion of Jesus or the rejection of your family? For those of you who are fearful of standing up for Christ because you're afraid of the re reputation that you have as a, result of your, with, as a result of being with your unbelieving friends, let me ask you this. What matters more, the opinion of Jesus or the rejection of your family? For those of you who are going on missions, of whom I count to be a privilege to be part of, when you find yourself in a situation where you can share the gospel with an unbeliever, whether it's in Anhui, East Asia, Panama, or Thailand, you're afraid of what that person might say. You're afraid of what that person might react. You're afraid because maybe you don't have all the right answers. When that time comes, let me ask you this. What matters more, the opinion of Jesus or the rejection of those people? These scenarios and a million more ultimately come down to one issue that we need to settle and con have conviction within our hearts that who we believe matters more. For Stephen, Jesus mattered more. 
For Stephen, this view of Jesus eclipsed the view of everything else. For Stephen, there was no crowd loud enough, no crowd angry enough that could ever take his eyes off of Jesus Christ. There was no group that was more intimidating, more scary, more greater than the glory of Jesus Christ. Simply put, Jesus Christ and his glory eclipses the opinion of man, even when he was faced with death. And I also want to encourage you with this, that no matter how they respond, even if they respond with rejection, understand that God is sovereign. And like Stephen's death, Saul's persecution, he will use it in order to spread the gospel. Saul, as we know later in Acts chapter 9, will become the greatest missionary to ever live. He would pen half of the New Testament roughly. Why? Because God is sovereign. And only he can bring about divine flourishing and violent oppression. Tertullian was wise to say that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. Because God will intend to use violent oppression and bring about divine flourishing. As he did with the death of Christ. As he does with the death of Stephen and those who will be rejected for his sake. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your word and what it says. Thank you, Lord, that your word reminds us that your gospel cannot be stopped. And though man <coughs> may reject your word, though man might violently seize those who speak the truth and lock them away, Lord, we know ultimately your word cannot be stopped. So, Lord, help us then to be faithful in preaching the gospel and being faithful in living out the Christian life to our friends, families, and those who don't know Christ. Help us, Lord, to have a vision of Christ that is so great that it eclipses all other views, including the opinion of man. And, Lord, I pray that as we go forth to our unbelieving world, Lord, that we would have that attitude in mind. So Christ, would you be honored and glorified for Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Amen.